The Red River divides Fargo, North Dakota from Moorhead, Minnesota. Most of this footage was taped along its frozen banks on December 4th, 1987. In the snow at the river's edge, 11-year-old Junior Garza and his 9-year-old brother Joey were out playing with a couple of friends. They found a dead squirrel lying frozen in the snow. Hey, look at this girl. Look at this girl. When a throw landed the squirrel 75 feet out into the frozen river, they dared each other to go get it. I dare you for nothing. Oh, you go. I'll dare you. I'll go, but you're going to give me a three-piece card. Yeah, whatever. Finally, Junior Garza agreed to go out onto the ice. The river looked frozen solid, but the ice was only two inches thick. Junior, come back. You're going to fall in. Junior, don't go. I see the thin ice that he was sliding on, and that's when he fell through the ice. He went up and down about two times, and then he went all the way down. Joey Garza ran to get the mother, and Clark Longy to call for help. The call to 911 came in at 4.14 p.m. Emergency center. My friend fell in the river. MP 211, 2.31. They have a report of a child in the river. Parties calling from Riverview Heights. No further information. Within four minutes, firemen from Moorhead arrived with a boat. The boy was already trapped somewhere in the freezing cold water under the ice. We were basically confronted with a hole in the ice. His mother was out there screaming and hollering, hurry, hurry, hurry. Rescue workers from both sides of the river began a desperate search for the boy. With the equipment that we had, we weren't prepared for that rescue. Because you got to get on the ice, you have to break the ice, and then get to the place where that individual has fallen in. The river was so murky, you could probably see two or three inches down into the river. It was a matter of concentrating on the river bottom and try and feel for something different, something unusual. The work was backbreaking and dangerous. If a rescuer fell into the 32 degree water, he would be risking his own life. They were really intense. One guy in the front of the boat usually was trying to hold the boat's location with the pole, and then the guys in the back of the boat were searching the water. And you're working, and the time is going fast, but then in your own mind you're keeping track, and it just seemed like it had been too long for any type of a survivable rescue. The boy had been under more than 30 minutes. The light was failing, the temperature was dropping rapidly, and hope was wearing thin. It was getting dark. There was some talk about who was going to call the rescue attempt and make it a body recovery either that night still or later on. But one of the firemen had read about cold water drownings. He knew that a few children had survived more than half an hour without breathing if the water was cold enough. We were exhausted. I couldn't even hang on the pole anymore. I just kept telling the guys, we still got time. We still have time. Harold was the biggest factor out there on the ice that day. We've still got time. We've still got time, he kept saying. I didn't know if we had any more time. I didn't know if the boy had any more time. We had all night, but I didn't know if the boy had any more time. I felt something unusual on the end of the pole. Something soft, something different. purple. It's like picking up like a water balloon. Okay, 
They're coming. Come on, Jim. Jim and everybody. The boy had been under the icy water for 45 minutes. He was clinically dead. At that point, I didn't think he had much chance of survival. I wouldn't have been on even a resuscitation. I did not feel that he would have had a resuscitatable brain. He was rushed to St. Luke's Hospital, where a team of medical specialists was waiting, headed by Dr. William Norberg. At 5 o'clock, a 11-year-old child was brought to the emergency room at St. Luke's Hospital. Until we give up all hope of his survival, we will keep him on maximal support, keep him on ventilators, and do whatever medical mir miracles we currently seem to be able to do uh, to keep him going. They opened his chest and put him on total life support. His body temperature was 77 degrees. He had no heartbeat, no respiration, no brain activity. In your mind, you said, this is much worse than I had thought. His heart didn't beat. I mean, it just laid there, and it did nothing, and it was stiff and hard and cold. We pumped the blood from the heart-lung machine through a special filter, and gradually, with the, the warming of the body and warming of the heart-lung machine, it sort of pinked up in color, and all of a sudden, sort of started to beat. At 10 o'clock, uh, we were trying to decide whether he'd had irreversible brain damage. During this period of time, he had shown no responses whatsoever, no response to pain. We can make a body survive, but sometimes we come out with a brain-dead patient. By the next morning, the nation was waiting for each new update on the boy's condition, hoping that he would be all right. At about midnight, he moved his feet a little bit, and at 2 o'clock, he responded to touch a little bit. And today, he seems to be responding to uh, sound and the verbal stimuli. When Junior opened his eyes, I thought that he, ha he was remembering what had happened under the water. He closed his eyes and he was crying. I was crying, but see, I didn't want him to see me. Two and a half weeks later, just before Christmas, Junior Garza was released from the hospital. I can't wait to get home and back to school. Merry Christmas, everybody. That was the nicest Christmas we had ever had. Yeah. The nicest one, because I had Junior home with me. One year later, Junior has fully recovered. Good things do happen where a lot of people work very hard, try very hard, and care very much, and maybe that's what a miracle truly is. I think I'm really lucky because he pulled me out of the river and I had a second chance at life.